We're happy now to turn to our last speaker, Davide Gaiato, who will be telling us about uh, Twisted M Theory. So I was hoping to turn on my camera to I'm having a disappearance. Oh, okay. Oh, you're still, okay. Uh, do, do, do I unshare? Sorry, I'll figure this out. I think it would be nice if uh, more people yeah. turn on their cameras. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, as Great. long as it's okay with the, with the bandwidth, it's nice yeah. to see faces for sure. Okay, now we see you and your slides. Great. Okay. Very good. Uh, perhaps I, do, do, will, you, will you let me know if somebody is asking questions from the chat or should I open the chat too? Um, I, I, if it's convenient for you, I, I, many people uh, find it difficult to follow the chat while they're speaking. So if something comes up, we can let you know. Um, That's fine. I just need to. Uh, okay. Now I share screen again. Uh, hmm. I still don't know how to see the chat while sharing the screen. Uh, okay, sorry. <laughs> well, just speak up. We'll I'm speak happy. Up. To. Yeah, speak up. Every, everybody, feel free to speak up if you have a question. Okay, so I would like to discuss uh, twisted M theory uh, and, uh, and some work I've done in the subject in collaboration with uh, Jivan Ho, Miroslav Rapka, and uh, Jakub Abajani. Uh, part of it is already out on the archive and some part will come out very soon or next week. So I would like to start by sort of describing with uh, which sort of things you can do with twisted interior or twisted supergravity. So the notion of twisted supergravity was introduced by Kevin Costello some time ago. Uh, and I don't feel it has percolated through the physics community enough yet. Uh, so let me just try to describe it a little bit. Let me start by describing a possible problem you might want to address. Uh, suppose that you're studying the low energy effective field theory, low energy supergravity theory, associated to the M theory or string, or string theory. So you write your supergravity action and then you try to write down an effective action with Hager and Hager curvature corrections. And of course, supergravity is tough and uh, already writing down the supersymmetric action of supergravity is tricky. Supergra writing down a supersymmetric effective action where you don't have a of shell formalism can be really painful. Uh, it becomes even more painful if you try to couple supergravity to a, to a brain. Suppose I wanted to know which consequences uh, does the existence of the zero brains have on, uh, on the effective action of supergravity. Um, well, okay, now I get, sorry, I got the, the chat out and I cannot make it disappear. <laughs> There was a way to see the microphone. It was to see the, the mouse. I, I need to see my mouse, sorry. I, I just uh, moved to a different computer and... Uh, okay, David, the, clearly you haven't been teaching three times a week. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I just, just need to set the preferences so that the, that the mouse is showing. I, just, I don't remember where was that. Maybe in share screen. Uh, no, I guess. Well, I try to do it without seeing the mouse, but then I really cannot access the, uh, the chat. So please. Uh, okay. okay. So now suppose that I want, you want to figure out if the existence of supersymmetric brains uh, puts any constraints on the effective action of supergravity. It's a reasonable question because uh, you, you need to write down a, a word, word line action, or word volume action for your brain, which has all sorts of uh, couplings, higher curvature couplings to, your, to, the, to the supergravity fields, and which is still supersymmetric. And your brain might have a volume theory, which is not just a nice free theory. Perhaps it's, uh, you're studying the theory of M2 brains, multiple M2 brains, and you have a superconformal field theory, which has a whole collection of interesting operators that your supergravity fields will couple to. And the OPEs of these operators will, will enter the calculations of your, uh, which you do to check if the, if the coupling is BRST invariant, it's supersymmetric. So it's, if the coupling is supersymmetric. Um, so this looks like a very tough problem. Um, the, 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 so twisted supergravity is a tool that you can uh, use to simplify this problem, or at least separate out a piece of this problem. Uh, you are probably familiar with the idea of 
twist or topological twist, although it's not always topological, of supersymmetric quantum field theories. You take your, a supercharge and you add it to the BRST generator. And in so doing, you obtain a new theory where the physical observables are what used to be supersymmetric observables of the original theory. And the observation of Costello was that you can turn on a background for uh, a super ghost in supergravity, which does the same thing to the supergravity theory. And so it, it uh, effectively restricts the supergravity theory to some supersymmetric field configurations. And in the same, uh, at the same time, also twists automatically the volume theories of the brains, of the, of the supersymmetric brains. So after you apply this twist, uh, instead of asking if you can couple supersymmetrically a brain to supergravity, you can just ask if you can couple in a BRST invariant way, in a gauge invariant way, the twisted volume theory of the brain to the twisted supergravity. And if you choose your twist judiciously, you can obtain something which is still, which is now computable, but perhaps still very rich. And if you look at Kevin's papers, you can find a variety of examples where indeed you, you get strong constraints, where you have an effective bulk theory, which has counter terms over which you have no control, unless you try to couple it to a brain. And then suddenly the counter terms gets fixed. All the counter terms gets fixed. So the non-normalizable bulk theory is effectively normalizable because there is no, no freedom issues in the counter terms. Uh, it seems to me that these twisted supergravity statements must contain very powerful non-renormalization theorems for the physical theory, which have, which have not been spelled out. So that's for me one motivation to start studying twisted supergravity more carefully. Uh, I mean, just, just think about all the work that has been done to say, verify that n equal a supergravity in four dimensions have no, no divergences. Uh, and then the divergences are found perhaps in seven loops or some inordinate loop level. I could imagine that perhaps an equal a supergravity has counter terms, but they are fixed if I require it to be coupled to some of the uh, brains which are available in an equal a super compatification of superstring. Another application of supergravity, of twisted supergravity, is holography. Uh, the idea is simple you just apply the twists to both sides of the holographic duality. And so you obtain some twisted. Uh, supersymmetric quantum field theory, which should be dual to some background, special background for twisted supergravity, something analogous to ADS times S. Um, but now both sides of the duality are potentially fully computable. Uh, you can just check if this whole gigantic subsect of the, of the holographic duality is correct or not. And if it's correct, you can perhaps start studying uh, if you choose your twist judiciously, non-trivial questions about quantum gravity. I don't know which geometry, which subtle points will contribute to the twisted supergravity path integral in order to reproduce the twisted quantum field theory result. This is a sort of question which uh, might, you know, might, might teach you something about the original physical theory as well. So this is a second motivation. Now, at the thing that is useful to remember is that um, there are some special twists, which are called omega deformations, which lower the dimensionality of the problem. They localize your calculations to, some, to the fixed points of some rotations. Um, and there is a classical example, which you know, comes from the prehistory of string theory almost, uh, which is topological strings. If you take 10 dimensional uh, string theory, type 2a or type 2b, and you turn on an omega background in, in two planes, the theory becomes effectively six-dimensional and it is described by topological string theory. Uh, this is the so-called self-dual gravity photon background. Uh, if, you, if you take, for example, the B-twist, the, the B you obtain a theory of gravity, which, is, which controls the complex structures of the six-dimensional uh, manifold. It's called Kodara spencer theory. And it's not, you know, at first sight is not normalizable. Um, and then you can encounter theorems in, in Kevin's papers that tell you that this Kodara-Spencer theory has unique, a unique choice of counter terms 
if you require it to admit a coupling to holomorphic Chan Simons theory, which is the volume theory of brains. Uh, in this setup, brains appear as objects which wrap two of the four omega deformed directions and some of the directions in the manifold. And they become the, topolo the, the topological brains or topological strain theory. Now, the setup I'm interested in is twisted M theory. So instead of, you, so you start from 11 dimensional flat space and you, you do a twist which introduces omega deformations in three planes. Uh, the ones that I've indicated on the screen as R epsilon one, R square epsilon one, R square epsilon two, and R square epsilon three. Uh, you want to preserve the, the Calabial form so that the omega deformation parameters adapt to zero in the three planes. Uh, I'm really sorry that I, I, I cannot even point to the screen at the moment. Uh, I forget how you make the mouse appear on the. So you just have to imagine it. So after you, so this omega deformation uh, eliminates three, six of the directions of, a, of the n-dimensional supergravity and, and leaves you with the five-dimensional theory. Uh, this five-dimensional theory treats two, one of the directions in a different way from the other two. It's kind of holomorphic uh, in, in, a, in the C2 factor of the, of the geometry and topological in the R factor. It's a kind of a gravity that controls the evolution of complex symplectic structures. So you should imagine that this C2 is, equi is equipped to a complex symplectic form. And this theory of gravity will evolve how this kind of phase space uh, uh, is fibered along the time direction, the first factor in the, in the geometry. Which kind of brains can I couple to this system? I have M2 brains and M5 brains. And in order to preserve supersymmetry, then two brains must have two directions along the omega deform space time. And then five brains have to have four directions along the uh, directions along the omega deformation. So then two brains will give you particles, topo topological particles, which actually essentially wrap the topological factor. They move along time. Uh, then five brains will give you holomorphic strings, which wrap one of the holomorphic directions. And so this theory will have roughly three types of particles, which come from the true brains wrapping the first or the second or the third factors of the geometry. And they'll have three types of strings corresponding to the three different ways the five brains can wrap uh, the internal directions. The, let, let me start from the, from the coupling of the bulk theory to a single M2 brain. The volume theory of a single M2 brain is free. It's very straightforward. There is just a bunch of scalar fields to describe the motion of the true brain in the eight transverse directions. The omega deformation makes the, t the volume theory into a word line theory, a one dimensional theory. And uh, it kills essentially uh, four out of those eight scalar fields. The remaining four scalar fields pair up into two complex fields, which control the motion in the C2 factor of the geometry. And uh, the action for the the word line action is very simple. It's just a sort of PQ dot action, right? It's the action of a topological quantum mechanics. There is no Hamiltonian uh, for a particle moving in, in a two-dimensional phase space. Although this phase space has been sort of complexified. This is an analytically continued quantum mechanics. So X and Y are valued in, in C2? That's correct. And uh, the C2 was equipped with a symplectic form so you should think about this as a phase space. Wasn't the word volume of the brains infinite? How did you get um, just a finite answer? Well, uh, it often happen happens when you have these omega deformations that the volume of these R R R2 epsilon factors is finite. It's, it's one over epsilon. So if you look at this action, there is a one over epsilon one or one over epsilon two or one over epsilon three, which are the effective volumes of these uh, of these internal factors for the three types of M2 brains. And then there is the integral along time. Does this answer the question? Um, okay, yeah. Actually, there, there are uh, equivalent uh, volumes. 
yes, it's the equivalent. It's, so this one over epsilon i is the equivalent volume of the factor r, r true epsilon i, which the true brain is wrapping. Later on, I will, well, I, I, I discuss the bulk theory, and the action of the bulk theory will have a one over epsilon one, one over epsilon true, one over epsilon three factors in front, uh, which come from the volume of the whole six dimensional space. Should I think of these modes as, so these modes that are described by this action you have here are some some fluctuations of the brain that are localized near the origin of these other planes? Uh, yes. Yes. That's right. So the brain is uh, infinite, but the fluctuation, the, the, there is this fluctuation that has a small size of order one over epsilon localized near the, the center. I think so. I think okay. that's a, a good perspective. So it has a profile which roughly goes, goes down fast away from the, from the center. Okay, so the true brain by itself, not yet coupled to the theory of gravity, is a topological quantum mechanics with phase space C2 uh, complexified. Now let's see if you can guess what's the effect of coupling to gravity. How would you modify this action uh, in the most natural possible way? Especially if you, you know, had just done, you know, classical mechanics, uh, uh, classical mechanics course. Well, you would add an Hamiltonian. So, uh, the the effect of coupling the M two brains to uh, to the gravity background is just to add an Hamiltonian to this quantum mechanics. The gravity fields are the Hamiltonian. Um, now, you, you might you might be not familiar with this fact, but is the action for a for a particle uh, has a has a gauge symmetry. So if you if you do a canonical transformation uh, of x and y together with a appropriate shift to the Hamiltonian, the action is invariant. Uh, so the the Hamiltonian in quantum mechanics is nothing else than a connection for the group of symplectomorphisms. Uh, and this word line action is kind of a whistle line uh, for, 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 the, for, for gauge theory with uh, targeted symplectomorphisms. So you should imagine that this bulk field H tells you how the five dimensional geometry is glued together. It tells you how the complex phase space, how the, how the C2 factor of the geometry is fibered as a, as a symplectic manifold along the real direction. It's a, it's a very peculiar expression. And uh, actually, I realize, I, I realize it looks so nice only yesterday after working on this for, for more than a year. Uh, but yes, so the, the gravity theory is a, controls the time evolution of a phase space classically. Now, what happens quantum mechanically? Is this action gauge invariant quantum mechanically? Not just, so notice there are three M2 brains, and the action of the three M2 brains have different H bars in front, and I want these actions to be simultaneously gauge invariant. Well, there is a problem. Once I treat this, this action quantum mechanically, the action of symplectomorphisms is deformed. Simple reasons don't act in quantum mechanics, the metaplectic group acts. Right? If I look at the generators of simple morphisms, Hamiltonians of the forms x to the n and y to the n. Uh, well, in quantum mechanics, I had to promote them to something like a, a while order product. I can take the commutator and there are deformations. The commutator is deformed from the symplectic group. And the deformation is controlled by the, by the Planck constant. So, I could say, if, it, if I just had one type of M2 brain, I could say, well, maybe the bulk theory has a gauge group which is deformed quantum mechanically to the metaplectic group. But that cannot be the case because I could not make this work at the same time for the three M2 brains. 
like the generators to the bulk symmetry uh, will, will are supposed to map to some deformation of the classical generators at some you know power C in epsilon i, and it just does not work. So how do we restore gauging? How do we restore gauging variance? Were the three types of brain of M2 brains or X and Y the same modes? Oscillations in C2? Yes. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what comes to save us is, uh, is the general theory of how to produce gauge invariant line defects in a topological quantum field theory. So uh, there is a general theory which has been developed again by Kevin, essentially, but I mean, or at least presented in a physical context by Kevin, although it comes from, uh, from the whole theory of A-infinity algebras and, and how to deform A-infinity algebras. Uh, and the idea is that if you have a, a quantum field theory with a topological direction, you are trying to create a line defect, which is BRST invariant in the theory, uh, the data of invariant couplings to the line defect is the same as the data of an algebra morphism from some mysterious object, which is, which is the causal dual to the algebra of bulk observables, to the algebra of operators on your world line theory. Now, in, in the case theories you're familiar with, this mysterious object is just the universal developing algebra of the Lie algebra, or the, or the gauge algebra. So a map from the universal developing algebra into the observables of the world line theory is just a set of instructions for how to act with my gauge symmetry on the operators, right? I'm just mapping my symmetry generators to operators in the theory, making sure that the commutator works. But the crucial point is that in sufficiently complicated situation, uh, the, the symmetry algebra does not have to be a universal omega developing algebra. It's possible to have gauge anomalies that appear order by order in perturbation theory, which force your gauge algebra to commutators to have corrections which are polynomial in the generators. So in principle, what could happen is that there is some algebra in the bulk, some symmetry algebra in the bulk, which admits a, a restriction of this sort. The, so this, this algebra will have some generators T and M with some complicated nonlinear commutators, such that the map from T and M to the while algebra given in this slide is an algebra morphism, is an isomorphism, uh, sorry, algebra morphism. So in a sense, you can hope for the non, non, for the nonlinear terms in the commutator to, to uh, correct uh, the, the problem that we're finding in, the, in making the, the three inch types of entry brains agree. And so, it, it happens that if you if you look carefully, there is a rather unique nonlinear deformation of the algebra of the universal level enveloping algebra of the symplectic morphisms. Uh, it has, especially if you sort of require it to be to preserve the C2 invariance of C2, to preserve the weight, the scaling weight of this of the of these oper of these generators and the, and the of the epsilon i parameters and to treat the three epsilon i's in a symmetric way. And this magic algebra has precisely the property that all three maps from the algebra to the world line theories of the M2 brains are algebra morphisms. So if the bulk uh, theory has this algebra as the symmetry algebra, uh, then it's possible to couple it to all three M2 brain, types of M2 brains. Now, Kevin, use some duality chains to propose a description of the bulk theory. Essentially, if you take this field H and you rescale it by one of the epsilons, it doesn't matter which, uh, you should be able to, you, you get, a, you get a, a new field, let me call it A, which behaves in, in a lot of ways like a U1 connection, more precisely a connection for U1, uh, non-commutative U1 gauge theory. So Kevin wrote down a, Five dimensional just sum was actually. Now that mm -hmm. it, so is, is, are you summing over I here or? No, 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 I just pick one of them. So this, essentially Kevin found 
use the duality chain, which depends on the choice of one of the three directions. Uh, if you go back to the 11 dimensional geometry, essentially you, you can reproduce, they can replace two out of the three R2 factors with the tau nut and the sense to type two yeah. A okay. right, with thanks. the six brain. And then the remaining omega deformation converts the six brain one volume theory into a five dimensional Chen-Simons theory. So these parameters I write in here in the action epsilon and delta are related in a pretty simple way to the epsilon i's. Um, so this is a five dimensional Chen-Simons action uh, for a non commutative U1 gauge field. So see, my wedge products are taken with the help of a non commutative Moyal product on the, on the, on the plane, or on situ, sorry. And then there is an overall coupling, one of epsilon one. So this, this, um, you can think about this action as something which is sort of uh, appear, appearing naturally when one of the epsilons is much smaller than the others. And so Kevin demonstrated that this action, again, at low naively non randomizable, it's perfectly good. Indeed, it has no counter terms. Uh, all the possible, as long as you put the theory, all counter terms can be absorbed in the redefinition of epsilon and delta. And he argued that if you use this theory to compute the symmetry algebra, this universal algebra which controls line defects, you'll obtain precise in this algebra A epsilon one epsilon two, which I mentioned. As I said, this description that Kevin gives is not symmetric in epsilon one and epsilon two, or epsilon three. Uh, there are three sort of distinct descriptions. And the fact that they give an algebra which has a basis, which is triality invariant, is a very nice check for the consistency of the whole picture. And then the fact that it can be coupled to the three types of entry brains is another important check. Sorry, David, uh, could you look yeah. back a slide? I'm, I'm really getting lost. So where are X and Y loading? No, 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 next slide. The five yeah. that you mentioned, go to the five, yeah. Where are X and Y, where are X and Y loading? So this action is a five dimensional action. Uh, Why is it five dimensional? What are the five dimensions? Well, I have a three form wedged against the X, the Y. So I take my Chan Simon's three form built out of the connection and I wedged against the X, the Y, against the synthetic form. Oh, 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 I see what you're doing. Okay, got it. So see, this is an action which depends yeah. on the shape of <laughs> okay, uh, okay. the effects structure. Uh, by the way, until what, what time I have, until what time uh, is my seminar going? Yeah, I, I was just trying to remember that myself. Uh, oh, uh, give me a few minutes to calculate it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Just keep so going. You, hmm? Keep going. You're the last speaker. Yeah, yeah, keep That's going. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that doesn't take several hours, but yeah, within reason, just keep going. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, all right, so to recap, um, there is five-dimensional theory. Classically, it's a theory of, uh, take, which controls the evolution of a phase space uh, in time. Uh, classically, it can be coupled to three types of uh, M2 brains, well, really to any type, meaning uh, the coefficient in photodaction of M2 brains, classically, don't, doesn't matter. Quantum mechanically, the well you need a definition in the bulk and whatever definition you give must have the property that remains compatible with the work line with the fully quantum work line action of the three types of two brains uh, kevin given the definition using dualities uh, in terms of you want simon's theory and this definition seems well defined perturbatively at least in the perturbation theory where Delta has to be greater than epsilon, essentially. Uh, and it gives some symmetry algebra, which we checked uh, is triality invariant, although the five dimensional Chen Simon's action is not. 
and can be coupled to the three types of exuberance. Now, Kevin had another nice check, uh, which involves looking at the, at the coupling to multiple exuberance. And now this is starting to get um, really interesting back in the physical theory, because now we have the super, super conformal field theory, which lives on the volume of multiple exuberance. And we're trying to couple it to super 11 dimensional, dimensional supergravity in a supersymmetric way, uh, including the, you know, the effects of all the OPEs of local operators on the in the Entrubrain CFT and of whatever tower of uh, higher curvature corrections in 11 dimensional supergravity. See, I mean, somehow this Chensamo's action must arise by careful localization calculation of the five dimensional Chensamo's of the 11 dimensional supergravity theory. So nobody has done it. Um, if you expand it out, it, it looks cubic, but yeah, it, it is cubic, but because of the star product, it involves a sum over, with inf it's an infinite sum over higher and higher derivative terms. But the gauge symmetry is somehow strong enough to fix all of these counter terms. Now, the work, once you apply the omega deformation to the work volume theory of the two brains, you obtain, you obtain a one dimensional quantum mechanics, which can be described rather explicitly. It's the quantum mechanics whose target space, whose phase space, is the modelized space of non commutative U1 instantons. So this was supposed to be instantons, not instants, autocorrect. Uh, so if you have n m two brains, you look at the space of n non-commutative one instantons. You, you treat it's an hyperkeller manifold, in particular, it's complex symplectic. You treat it as a phase space, and that's the target of the word line theory. You can describe it by an in the in ADHM style gauge quantum mechanics, where there is a UN gauge group, a pair of adjoint fields. Uh, and a pair of fundamentals. This, the algebra of observables of this word line theory depends on two parameters. One is the quantization parameter, I call it epsilon one. And the other is, a, is an FI parameter which controls the degree of non-commutativity of the instantons. And well, you can wonder, is, can I couple this to the bulk theory? Is there a nice, map of algebras from the universal algebra to this word line theory. And so, yes, and not only that, uh, it's actually a very simple map. Uh, again, for, for quite a while, because when I was studying this problem, it looked like the map was very complicated to be built order by order patiently. And then after a lot of time, we realized that actually, if you just take the symmetric Trace, th symmetrized traces of x to the n, y to the n, where these are joint, uh, you know, n by n matrices of operators. Uh, you get generators which are precisely the generators, the natural generators in this algebra. So yes, the this ADHM quantum mechanics can be coupled naturally to the to this Hamiltonian field. We just take the Hamiltonian evaluated on these matrix values fields, and you take the trace of it. In the in the most in the sim in the symmetrized trace sense, and again I should stress right the, the, the fact that you have again the the the, the three the three the three epsilon parameters are treated very differently in the in this setup. The fact that the universal algebra is triadic invariant is not not trivial at all. Uh, another important observation by Kevin, which has probably some holographic meaning is that you don't just have a map from the universal algebra to the algebra of the NM, of the M2 brains. But if you take the algebra of M2 brains, you just send the number of M2 brains to infinity, you get precisely the bulk algebra. So there is, as I said, there's probably some holographic meaning to the statement, but uh, I haven't decoded it fully. David, is there, is there a D-brain interpretation of what you just said? Uh, Well, I think so. Uh, so this is this ADHM quantum mechanics is the world, world line theory of a D2D6 system. 
That's why I'm asking. Yes. That's right. It's produced by the same duality manipulation. So the fact that these algebras agree is probably related to the fact that this the word line theory of a D2D6 system can be clearly coupled to the D6 frame of volume theory, which after omega deformation is the Chersamos theory. So yeah, I would say yes. Uh, there is, if you, go, if you go to the duality frame, you have lost the gravity because everything is coming from the D6 frame and you're just claiming that there is a supersymmetric coupling between the D2 brain and the D6 brain. But, right. Uh, the fact that the, the whole structure is trial invariant or sort of pushes things back to M theory. You, you, there is no duality, strain duality frame in which you could describe all three, uh, all three couplings. Well, maybe the statement is not fully correct. Uh, I, I, I think about it. Now, nobody forces you to have line diff, line, you know, line, particles which are made of M2 brains of the same type. In principle, you could very well take, make a general particle by intersecting three stacks of M2 brains and one wrap in the first factor and two wrap in the second factor and three wrap in the third factor. There should be some word line theory which leads at the intersection of three M2 brains. We don't know the theory. Uh, we don't know what is the intersection of three stacks of M2 brains. Uh, I don't know if there is some string duality frame where one can figure it out. Um, but it should be the case that there is a map from this universal algebra to the, to the word line theory of this intersection, uh, in which sense the generator T0, 0, which was just super trace of one, pretty much. So it was just trace of one in the individual M2 brain theories uh, to this particular value. And so presumably you can, and we have been trying to do it, you can sort of work out what the word line theory is for this intersection of M2 brains by taking the universal algebra and, and seeing if it truncates at this particular value in some nice way. Uh, Right, so I don't know if there is Lagrangian an alternative Lagrangian description that one could use to, to match against. Now, something which I should, that I find very interesting is that uh, I did not have to take the background to be R times C2. I could have used a different uh, two dimensional phase space different complex symplectic surface. It's relatively straightforward to find variants of the construction I described, which apply to surfaces like an ADE singularity, C times C star, the complex torus, C star times C star. In all of these situations, you can identify M2 brain word, word line theories, which describe M2 brains exploring these, uh, these geometries. Uh, the algebras are appropriate quantization, so the model is based on the commutative instantons on, this, on these surfaces. In all of these cases, the final answer, you find the universal algebra by sending the number of instantons to infinity. And this universal algebra is trial invariant, which it should, you know, it should be the case if it comes from a, uh, from a background of the form R times S times three omega deform factors. But, if I take a generic surf, complex symplectic surface, which is not one of these examples, I have no idea if I can always define the quantization of the model space on computer instantons and take the large n limit. And it's far from obvious that this large n limit would always be triadic invariant. So I think there are two options here. Either there is some deep mathematical theorem that says that to every complex symplectic surface, I can attach a, a triality invariant algebra with some interesting truncations to uh, non commutative instantons. Uh, or there must be some constraint on what, on the global structure of the of space time, on which complex surfaces I can put my, my twisted and theory on. So either way, it should be interesting. So I've been trying to study these various examples. Uh, you, you find, 
all sorts of interesting uh, algebras, which have been very studied mat mathematically, affine Jungians, uh, quantum toroidal algebras. But the general story is not, is not there yet. Did you get a, a rough idea of how much time do I have? Uh, yeah, I think I think uh, uh, you have maybe five more. I mean, yeah, okay. certainly take a few more minutes if you need it. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to mention something about the surface defects, the ones that come from M5 brains. So the details are a little bit sketchier because causal duality for holomorphic theories has not been quite uh, pinned down mathematically. But the expectation is that there will be a, some analogous kind of universal Kara algebra with the property that uh, a super, you know, a gauge invariant coupling to a surface defect is equivalent to a vertex algebra morphism from this universal algebra to the Karal algebra which lives on your defect. Okay, this was a mouthful. Uh, and the universal algebra, Karal algebra in, the, in this situation seems to be the W1 plus infinity algebra, which you may remember is the sort of, uh, Karal algebra that you, you get from the large and limit of, that, of, uh, of WN algebras. It's a Karal algebra which has one uh, generator in each conformal dimension. There is a dimension one current, a dimension two current, a dimension three current, and so on, all the way to infinity. Now, uh, so now you can ask, is it true that the Karal algebra I find on M5 brains after omega deformation accepts a map from this W1 plus infinity? Well, yes, it is actually true. So for example, if I have a stack of N and five brains, uh, essentially by AGT, we know that turning on an omega deformation on two planes uh, produces a WN algebra. And as I just said, WN algebras are a truncation of W1 plus infinity. So that's a nice consistency check. Now, if, a couple of years ago, with, my, with Miroslav Rapkak, we figured out which vertex algebras are supposed to arise at the intersection of multiple and five brains. So if we defined some corner vertex algebras, which lived at the intersection of three stacks of transverse and five brains, of and five brains uh, meeting along a plane. Uh, we call them Y, L, M, N. And one observation that we already had then, but we couldn't motivate, was the fact that this YLM element seemed to have some relation to W1 plus infinity. If you wrote the character for these vertex algebras and took LM and N to be large, it started resembling the McMahon function, which is the character of W1 plus infinity. And now we know why this is happening. It's because these, these stacks of fibers must admit a coupling to M theory. And that means that pretty much the vertex algebras that live on the intersections must be truncations or must be governed by the by the block by the W plus infinity. So that was a very nice, another very nice consistency check on the whole story. Something which I do not yet understand and I'm trying to understand is the role that junctions between two brains and five brains play. So again, there should be supersymmetric junctions between M2, where M2 brains and M5 brains or cross M5 brains. Uh, these would be point-like objects where the string meets a line. So there should be operators to the junctions which admit an action of both operators on the M2 brain and operators on the M5 brain. And somehow these actions must satisfy some properties in order for the whole thing to be gauge invariant. Unfortunately, which properties has not been worked out at all. So the sort of causal duality for junctions has not been uh, studied yet. Now, in previous work with uh, Miroslav, uh, or in work with O on the two brains, we had conjectures on either side, meaning we know more or less which vertex operators in the corner vertex algebras appear at the intersection with them in two brain, or which modules for them two brain algebra appear at the intersection with them five brain. But we're not being able to put together all the pieces yet. But in the partial work they've been doing, we've, we are finding all sorts of very interesting algebraic structures. Uh, our matrices, co products, my Mura transformations are all, all seem to be explained by and motivated uh, and necessary for 
gauge invariance of uh, twisted and theory. Uh, now, a project that I'm, is almost complete and I will talk about uh, on Monday uh, at IES, Zoom, at an IES Zoominar, uh, is an application of these, of these ideas to twisted holography. So there are some protected correlation functions on two brains where you put local operators on the equator of, a, of an string. This, the OPEs in this correlation, this correlation function are topological. They, they define a trace on the space of operators pretty much, or proper BPS operators. Uh, and the, where the, the OPE, where the multiplication between operators is governed by the algebras I was discussing now. There is an so you could uh, because these protected correlation functions are ah uh, you know how can I say this so this should be an ex one side of a twisted holography setup so it should be possible to match these protected correlation functions with twisted M theory on some background it roughly will look like it is two times s three although I still don't know what the uh, phase space way to think about this it is two times the three is. Uh, a big difference between studying the OPEs and studying correlation functions is that the OPEs were polynomial in N. So the large end limit was not hard. You never really needed to take a, take a large end limit very step. There was some holography in the OPEs, but it's not, it's not a back reactive holography. At least because N is poly, because everything is polynomial in N, in the OPEs you can treat the back reaction perturbatively. On the other hand, correlation functions have very, very interesting uh, large end behavior. Definitely not polynomial. Like the partition function behaves like e to the minus n to the three halves. Okay? Uh, so most of this project was about figuring out how to do a careful large end analysis of the sphere correlation functions. Uh, and we found a nice perturbative expansion and we find that there is a hidden triality invariance with which I think supports very strongly uh, the, the fact, the idea that the dual would be twisted in theory. Uh, so anyway, I think I've, okay. I think I've lost uh, the final slide somewhere, uh, but <laughs> so let me just say the conclusions, conclusions in words. So I think that twisted in theory is a, is a very nice playground I think potentially it should be at least as rich as topological strings were used. It must capture a variety of interesting neuronal normalization theorems and information about the uh, interior effective action. And I think it would be very interesting to decode what that information is. Uh, and also, right, it, it should provide a variety of examples of, of twisted holography, which I think it's worth studying. As I was saying, I, you know, my, my hope is that is to see in a computable setup uh, phenomena like sums over subtle points of, of, a, of gravity, you know, which, which subtle points might, in, might contribute to a uh, gravity path integral or things like that. See, um, yeah. As I was saying, there is, there is very rich uh, independence in the story. So there are, there are, there are really, you know, there is quantum gravity. Some in the... Okay. Any questions? Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Davide. Yes, surely there are some questions out there. Well, one question is, you didn't quite tell us what, what the starting point was. In the definition of twisted M theory, did you? Um, well, uh, let's see. So, I, well, I described roughly the background, um, saying that it's a that, that it turns on some omega deformations in three planes. So twisted M theory in this context just means that you consider this particular background or you specialize to some kind of observables. What, is, what does twist mean? Uh, 
So, right, the two, th the two things are done at the same, at the, at the same well, strictly speaking, and I'm giving an expectation value to some super ghost. Uh, yes, that was which, Kevin's definition. That's right, which definitely restricts the class of observables and dynamical degrees of freedom in the theory. Does it incorporate the omega deformation or does that put in separately? No, I think it's the, def so it's the, the choice of, um, let me see, I want to say this correctly. It's, it's a question which sometimes I find a bit tricky to answer because, so the way Kevin sets, set the question, sets the procedure up is he first twists and then he def simplifies the theory using the twist and then he deforms the simplified theory further. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this must be the equivalent to turning on this B, B, the, the super ghost background and some other physical fields background in the same way as the standard topological strings example involves a self dual gravity photon. Now I'm not quite sure which physical fields are turned on here. Uh, You're hoping that there's some physical field that implements the omega deformation? I would think so. So there was work done by uh, some authors, uh, Orlando, and, uh, uh, sorry, I'm very bad with names sometimes. Uh, but on, so there, are, there, were, there was previous work on trying to build omega deformed and theory backgrounds by turning on, just, just turning on some physical fields. There was, the, was it a flux trap? background or something like that. Uh, I don't remember the details. Mm -hmm. uh, we can ask you more questions, Mandek. Uh, yes. So the this field H comes mostly from the C field of interior, as far as I can see. So this coupling one of epsilon one a i h is it should be pretty much the integral of c on the intruder inverse volume. See that the intruder are coupled coupled electrically to to h. Um, then fiber is introduce a singularity in h. So that's very helpful. So is there some particular c field that you're turning on or? Well, this H should be just the dynamical, what's left of the dynamical C field. Ah, so, so that's, that's, the, that's the dynamics of... Yes. Is it, a flat C, is it a flat C field or no? I guess it's not. So it's just some my, C My guess is that it looks like H, the T wedge with the Keller form in, in uh, R6. Is there some dynamics or something that, that singles out that particular mode, those, those modes of the C field? I, I'm sorry. I, I, I've, not, I've really not done the, not, not even tried to do the exercise of uh, going through the, uh, super, no, explicitly twisting the superiority. I mean, it's, I, I think it's a, it's a great exercise, but I, <laughs> I'm not, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not, I'm a little bit scared of, uh, of super gravity. You can look into that over the weekend, Davide. Uh, <laughs> yes. Are there some other questions? I mean, I think a C field is definitely involved because Right, the, when you go to the type Shue background by, by reducing on tab nut, uh, the third omega deformation direction, sorry, the, the omega deformation in tab nut ends up producing a non commutative deformation of the world volume theory of the six brain. So that non commutative deformation typically comes from the B field. So I would assume that this B field comes from a C field in tab nut, but uh, so my guess is that there, mu there must be some kind of H flux, you know, C flux turned on, which implements part of the, of the omega deformation. 
something analogous to the self dual uh, Gary Photon. Then there May. would be some. Then there would be some contribution of the eleven-dimensional supergravity action, and, and you know, without not just looking at the brain actions, but just the eleven-dimensional supergravity action, wouldn't that be non-zero? Do we care? Well, definitely. So, I I would love to see, you know, explicitly that if you turn on some background in the supergravity effective action, you produce the expansion of the Shansamo's action. Is this just supposed to come from the CDC DC term in, in M3? In, in the 11 dimensional supergravity action? I would think so. Well, as I said, the star product involves, gives you an infinite sum of higher derivative terms. I would guess the part without derivatives has a good chance to come from the CDC. But uh, the higher derivative terms will come from higher derivative terms in the 11 dimensional action, presumably. You know, the analog to this uh, FG, w, w to the 2G terms in, uh, in topological strings. That would be my hope, at least. Uh, right, that, that all of these calculations are capturing pieces of the supergravity effective action. But which pieces, I don't know. I don't know. Not work it out. Davide, there's a question on chat. I'm not, I'm not sure if you're able to see it. Uh, I, I can read it to you. It's, thank you. It's, uh, it just, does twisted supergravity in general uh, preserve U-duality in various dimensions? I would think yes. So different, these different twisted supergravities seem to be related by the same dualities as the, uh, you know, as, as long as you include the string mode, I guess. Uh, I think, for example, uh, was it Phil Sangyo and uh, somebody else that recently checked that at least for the zero momentum sector, Type two B and type two A twisted supergravity is very related by duality. So you can you can definitely do this sort of uh, manipulations as long as the choice of supersymmetry is compatible on the two sides. It should be possible to go to duality. Any other questions? Okay, let's thank Davide again.